Um, yes, I'm Michael Wilson. I work for the Science and Technology Facilities Council, which is a research council. We fund research. It's not called a research council. It's got this funny word facilities in it. What we do a lot of is we run big science facilities. So big science facilities cost a lot of money. They produce data. And we've got an obligation to get the best use of that data we can get. What do we do? I'm going to describe what we do, what we do with data, and then I'm going to raise some issues that are problematic. So what we do, big facilities, how big do you want them? Big science, particle physics, we pay for and manage the UK subscription to CERN. That's a 5 billion euro facility. Uh, we do the same thing for European Space Agency. Uh, that runs at about a billion euros per mission. Uh, we also uh, build most of the cameras in most of the satellites that are watching you. Um, they mostly operate at about minus 270 degrees to try and keep all the atoms as stationary as possible so they're as sensitive as possible. And that's our speciality there. We get lots of data from there. We do various things in astronomy in the European Southern Observatory and other areas. Uh, so those were big facilities. The next one's coming along. Uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope was agreed funding this week. That will probably be a 10 billion euro facility. Uh, and the Square Kilometre Array, which will cover uh, Australia, Southern Africa, up to the equator, and may or may not spread across as far as Chile, uh, will be in the order of another 10 billion euros or so. So that's big science. But we also do small science. Small science is we manage the UK subscriptions to ILL, uh, which Jean-Francois will talk about in the next session more. Uh, that's a neutron source. We also have on our own national site uh, another neutron source called ISIS at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, uh, an X-ray source called Diamond, and a laser facility. So our national facilities tend to come in at about half a billion euros. Um, it's generally, we can persuade our minister to write a cheque for about half a billion. So we can either get one national facility or a contribution to an international one. Uh, but he won't write for any bigger cheques than that. And in order to keep writing them, we've got to show that he's getting his value for money. So I'm going to focus on the last ones, the small science, and talk a little bit about what these devices do for data. Uh, neutron sources and X-ray sources, are like, they're big microscopes. You're watching me, the light's coming in the window, it's bouncing off me and going in your eyes, the eyes of the detectors. These things have, not partic well, have particle accelerators that whiz around protons or whiz around electrons. They produce x-rays or they produce neutrons. That's like the, 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 the light coming in the, the window. Somebody brings along a little crystal, the, the light bounces off the crystal and it goes into a detector. The detector produces lots of data. In your case, the data goes from the eye to the brain and you interpret it. In our case, the data goes from the detectors to our computers. So in terms of data archives, uh, for the ISIS data, we've got about 3 million files over 20 years. Uh, that's files, so each file can be hundreds or thousands of records. And for the diamond, over the last five years, we've got 100 million files. Um, we also take the data from CERN in the last three years. We've got about 11 petabytes. That may sound big, but Sundre is talking after me from CERN, and it's only a fraction of what they produce. We've also got computers that people can use to analyze that. Um, these boasts only last a few months, so I'll make them while they're true. Uh, we currently have the UK's most powerful computer, uh, and also the UK's most powerful graphics processor-based computer. Um, those are used to analyze these sorts of data. We've got a large commodity computing cluster with 7,000 processing cores, which is used to analyze the CERN data. And we've got a, high, a new high-throughput super data cluster, um, which transfers the data at one terabit per second, um, which is used to analyze the Earth observation data and build models of climate change. Altogether, we've currently got a uh, a tape robot system with a 100 petabyte capacity for storage. And we're doubling our data every year. So a lot of big money's gone in, and it's producing a lot of data. We have to maximize the value of that. 
so the list the last speaker put up was why researchers might want to do use, use DOIs. This is a list of why we want to, what we think we want to do to get the most out of our data. Well, we've got to let the researchers access it. Comes off these machines, goes into our store. They want it the next day. Actually, they also want it in about 10 years' time when they've forgotten where they put their own copy and they can't remember what they labelled it as. Uh, when they find some new result they want to combine it with. So we've got to preserve it, we've got to keep it, we've got to keep it for them. They understand it, but we need to have it. We need other researchers to validate those results. The results of the analysis, the conclusions. They might want to take the data, they can't afford to new, do new experiments on these big pieces of equipment. You can't rerun certain events in history that were observed. So they, they need to get hold of that data. If it's in published papers, we want exactly, as was said in the previous talk, a DOI to reference the precise data set that was used and do that function very nicely. We want to promote people doing meta-studies. Yes, these are big equipment, they're expensive, but they still only have a certain sensitivity. Obviously, if people can take multiple data sets, they can often find effects that they couldn't find in any one data set. Again, they have to reference through the DOI how to find them. Those big machines, those big computers, aren't just used for analysis. A lot of them are used for modeling. Climate change is an obvious example. Also things like how um, galaxies are formed, how the universe was formed. Those models need all their parameters set. They also need data sets to test against. So they need to get access for a different use. Now those will be people who don't know the experiments, don't know what the equipment was, don't know what the settings were. They need a whole lot of new information to help them understand what the data means and how it's useful to them. We actually want to use this a lot for data. We don't, data for experiments or science, we don't know about yet. As was mentioned this morning, our oldest data set uh, is a continuous data set over 300 years, collected six times a day. Started off being collected so that people could get ships up rivers without them going aground. They knew how deep the water was. It's really important in climate change studies to have that sort of long-term data set. Nobody thought about using it for that before about 30 years ago. We've got other data sets, again, where people are coming with complete new uses. They don't know enough of, a lot about how that data was originally collected and what was done with it. They need to know a lot more information and they need the data. A lot of the stuff we're doing is about fundamental science, what the origin of the universe. A lot of the stuff we're doing is also, how do we get that new drug to cure cancer? How do we get that new material to make carbon-based computers because silicon chips are, have got a limited uh, growth potential? Those sorts of activities can have enormous financial payoffs. So th those are encumbered by patents and the whole um, issues of um, rights control and management. We've got issues at the moment about US courts uh, demanding electronic data, electro store, electronic stored information in defense of patent court in cases. Uh, in November last year, the judge demanded that all uh, electronic stored information for the last 18 years that was relevant had to be disclosed in a patent case. Now, there was another patent case last year in a similar issue, a financial issue, where he made a similar judgment about some data from six years ago. The company said they couldn't disclose it and they got a $20 million fine. So it's not just a matter of having the data and saying here it is or not. You've actually got to produce it. And if you don't produce it, you can face these enormous fines. So we've got to keep it. And that's on a 20 year scale. We also talk about evidence-based policy making. A lot of the policy stuff that's coming out of the climate change based on climate change models, based on the data sets, can be decades or centuries after they're produced. So we have to preserve it for a long time. We have to be able to identify it. People have to find it. They have to trace back through the literature where that data has been referred to. It was referred to in the Journal of the Proceedings of the Royal Society in 1797, and this is the data set. And they have to be able to find that. And yes, yesterday's and tomorrow's data sets too. As I go down that list, the users involved know less and less about the data. As I go down that list, the payoff is longer and longer in the future away from when that data was originally collected. And as I go down that list, 
the probability of actually any single data set producing that payoff is lower and lower. So we would have to make an investment, low probability, but a potential high impact. We, ha we have to try and understand that space of data and reuse and benefit. And we're trying to, but we understand why we're doing it. We don't know the economics enough yet. But we know that DOIs fit in there because they're an important way of maintaining reference to data sets. Data reuse. Uh, we've got various models of data reuse, various life cycles that we go through. It's essential in this cycle that we've got scientific publications. We've got various sorts of data being preserved in archives. People have to discover that data, and it has to go through, um, has to be available to them. But we want to promote that data reuse. A particular tool we use is our own metadata catalog, ICAT, which contains access to the data from those facilities, the, the, the super microscope types, the X-ray sources and the neutron sources. It contains also access to and stores the proposals that people submitted. So when people say, can we have some time on that facility, they write a proposal, we keep that, that goes in. When they come along to get, when they're scheduled, we tell them, yes, you can have that time on the facility, you can use it for what you ask for. When they turn up, they cut their data, they run the experiment, the data gets put on the archive, that goes into this catalog. They can then clean up that data. They calibrate it with some settings that are coming off the machine. That calibrated or cleansed version goes into the, the archive. They can download it. They can analyze it. They can do what they like with it. After that, they will have some results which they'll put into a publication. That publication will then use the DOI to cite the original source data, and that publication goes into the archive, or at least we have a link, a DOI, to the publication. So we can follow the chain, and not a single human being has touched anything to do with metadata so far. So this is a big contrast to what's happening in the social science area, where in order to get this to the scientists who want it and the people who want to validate the results, we can do this automatically. If I go further down that list I showed, then we've got to add more and more of the metadata in. That's the human investment, and that's where we need to understand where the payoff comes. We have lots of computers involved in this process, and they, of course, include access to DOI servers and to the data site system. It's an integral part of making this work. So we're trying to run it with automated metadata collector. We can schedule the proposal. That tells us who's doing what, who the funder is, what they're doing. The instrument tells us what the data is, what the data settings, the instrument settings were. The publication tells us what the analysis method was, what the results were. And the DOI is the address that links these things together. Except, 5% of people who turn up to use facilities don't actually do what they said in the proposal. They said, we're going to look at a piece of gold asinine simonate. And they turn up with a bit of plasticine. I mean, it, they look, bring along something different. Because they say they're going to bring along a crystal, put it in a big microscope, and see what its structure is might take three years, five years, just to grow that crystal to a two micron size that they can look at. They might be looking at the human ribosome as a single large crystal. And they want to put it in the machine and find out its structure. OK, that particular one's been done. The guy got the Nobel Prize for it. That's what we want to do our DOI for, because people want to know, where's that piece of data he got the Nobel Prize for? But in other cases, people are turning up with other things, and actually the system breaks because it isn't what it was in the proposal. When we get the paper published, it's about something else, and there's a conflict. Which data do we want to preserve? I've nicely said, system produces raw data, goes through a calibration phase, we've got calibrated data. That's automatic, that's automatic. We've got those. They do some analysis. That means they run some computer programs over this data. What computer program? They're producing various bits of derived data. What derived data? We don't have that anymore. They've gone away back to their laboratories, and they're doing that on their own. So we want to move on to a place where we can encourage people to submit those. But that's the same problem that the ESRC have and that other people have, where we're waiting on the, the researcher to, to give us something where they don't necessarily see the immediate benefit of it. We also have issues there immediately of deriving the provenance of all of that. 
which piece of software did they use? Have we actually, can we, do we have to retain and preserve that piece of software? Do we want to put a DOI on that piece of software so that we can say in our provenance, this is where the data came out of the experiment, this is where it was calibrated, that's automated, this is where the user took it away, they ran this particular piece of software, there's a DOI for the software as well as for the data so that somebody can replicate that. How do we actually preserve that piece of software? So we've got software from the 1960s that used to run on IBM 360 mainframes. And with IBM, we've actually got simulators of IBM 360 mainframes that'll run on laptop PCs today. So we can still run 40-year-old software. And it's this sort of replication can be done. But again, how do we reference it with DOIs and so on? Which data should actually be cited? Now, we're very we run facilities. We get paid to run facilities. Everything in our structure is about the facility. We allocate a beam time. That can last anywhere between five minutes and two weeks, depending on the different type of the experiment. And at the time that we allocate that beam time, we assign a DOI. And we say, this is where your data is going to be. And the investigation can be cited even before the data actually exists by people referring to the DOI. What level should the DOI go to? We assign beam time. We say you've got a day, you've got four days, you've got an hour. Now, we have one facility, so we assign the DOI on the basis of the time because that's the obvious thing in all our management system. In that time, they do an experiment. An experiment produces one or more data sets. Each data set can have one or hundreds of files. So we have a metadata structure which relates the experimental facility time there in the middle. That's the thing that we, it's our fixed point. Multiple data sets, multiple data files. We link our facility time to overall studies. That might be the grant proposal. Might be multiple experimental time for that. That's on a topic. We've got access control issues. There's related material, proposals, publications, other legal issues. We know who the investigator is. Because we're paying his grant, we're giving him time. We have got those people identified. But if they go and get married and change their names and they move universities, we, we don't actually persistently manage the, the individual identifier for the human. So in the same way that we're using DOIs for the data as persistent identifiers, we're very concerned about persistent identifiers for researchers. In this structure at the moment, we're allocating DOIs at the experiment level. That's what's being cited. But we will get to the point where we actually want to cite specific files. With our, the way we structured the namespace of the DOIs, we've, we've made management for that and there's provision that will allow us to either cite data sets or individual files or indeed records within files. As I say, when it's the Nobel Prize winning one. When it's, when it's that data set from CERN that we expect to hear about at the end of the year that says, this is the Higgs boson, here it is. That's what you spent all your money on. A lot of schools are going to want to say, can I show that to my 18-year-old physics students? Because that's going to enthuse them. They want to find that particular data set. That's the file that matters. You know, that's, that's the 5 billion euro file. They want it. So we are going to have to go down to find the granularities. We've got a system that will support that in the current DOI system. However, when do we publish the data? Well, we have about 1% of our data is commercial. We don't publish it, don't issue DOIs. In fact, we don't even archive it in most cases. The commercial people just collect it and take it away and, and we rub magnets over the, the machines to, to, to wipe everything clean. But we've got different sorts of facilities. They do different types of science. Different types of science have different policies about how long scientists should have unique access to their data. And normally there's some sort of embargo period that says a scientist can have the data for his own use for so long. We set that normally at around three years and we say, well, that's a PhD period. Often universities have got PhD regulations. If we were to let this data out, it might put that person's PhD in doubt as to whether it were original research and so on. But what's really important to everybody is that we record who accesses the data so that later on we know that somebody's accessed it. 
And it's quite common to talk about embargoing data. We also have a real problem with this idea. We have to embargo the metadata. There was an example, uh, 2004, I don't know if you know this, quite a famous one, um, in astronomy, where a Spanish uh, research team announced the discovery of a new planet in our solar system, Hume. And this was greeted with all the response that the press would greet somebody saying, we've discovered a new planet. And then it turned out that actually there were a group of people in California who'd also found it and previously announced a workshop when they were going to announce the discovery. And then it turned out that the Spanish people had actually got that announcement. And then they'd gone and looked at the record of where those Californians had been, which bit of data they'd been looking at. And they said, oh, well, they've announced a new they're thinking of announcing a new planet. This is the data they were looking at in order to announce a new planet. We'll look at that data. Oh, we can see a planet. Let's announce it now. So by being able to get access to the record of where some other scientist had accessed the data, they jumped in and took first announcement of a major discovery. So the scientists are really wary of knowing exactly who's accessed their data and yet not letting people know who's accessed their data or necessarily what data it is. And sometimes with this metadata, even knowing that a group of cancer researchers in a particular university is being funded by a particular drug company to look at a particular chemical is enough for another drug company to think, hmm, obviously since that team work on that type of cancers and they're looking at that, then they think that's going to be a potential new drug to cure cancer in that area. So just giving away the title could give away commercially very important information. So we've got issues about how long we embargo the metadata for, how long we embargo the access to the logs for, how long we embargo the, the, the data itself for. We want to avoid data misuse, not just in those ways. We've got lots of satellite Earth observation data, no problem. Except we've got some very detailed Earth observation data of events such as airplanes crashing into New York in 2001 which in 2001, every journalist wanted for reasons that we didn't want to deal with. So we have to decide how to deal with case, special cases like that. We've also got the inter UN International Panel, Panel on Climate Change data on which their reports are based, which we want to make available to the public so they can understand the issue. But we've got to, we can only make it available in such a way that the conspiracy theorists out there aren't suddenly going to jump on one tiny little fragment of it and make something out of it. Similarly with CERN data, we don't want people suddenly saying that's where the black holes are that they're making that are going to destroy the universe. Now we do want to publish samples for teaching, but if we do that, we've got to avoid the conspiracy theorists saying, but they're not publishing it all because they're hiding the, the real stuff. Science has to be verifiable, but we've got these real political constraints as well. We, and um, lastly, I just want to come back to the point that was made really far better earlier. We, a lot of money's been invested in this experiment. A lot of money's gone into the data collection. We need to justify, get the most use out of that. DOIs are a vital part of that process for data. They might be necessary for software. We need them to link, obviously, to publications to complete the cycle and so on. But we also need to determine what the return on investment is. How do we calculate it? Different people want it done in different ways. The European Space Agency have a financial model all based on space missions, not on long-term infrastructure. Some research councils believe in long-term infrastructure. Uh, some people believe in different ways of doing these evaluations, not only of the costs involved, but what the return is. Uh, we heard a bit about that earlier. Um, there's recent, and we also heard mention earlier of the evaluation of uh, the EDS, the, the, the um, UK Data Archives uh, by, by the ESRC. There are several things going on where people are looking at what are the costs, what are the returns, lots of different approaches. It's not quite a toolbox yet in the way that the opening speaker was talking about. It's more competing approaches, but they probably will turn into a toolbox. Uh, another one is a European project called Insure. Uh, which is looking at return on investment also in the, the commercial area of long-term data preservation and reuse for, for cloud-based systems. 
But the, the, before we can do anything of this, I repeat again what was said earlier, you have to know why you're preserving your data, what your objectives are in evaluating the activity involved. So as I said, I put up a list there, different objectives, different groups, different timescales, and trying to fit that with these different processes is turning out to be very difficult. But that's particularly an area that we're interested in as well. Questions?